Byron achieved his dream, and he reported for CBS 60 Minutes for several years, until March of last year when he became an anchor and chief national correspondent for ABC News. But Byron's greatest achievement was sitting through my ninth grade English class. <laughs> In 1974, I taught this young man at Archbishop Curley High School. And I feel like a parent tonight, uh, recognizing and introducing my son to you, who I am so proud uh, and so happy that he was able to make time to come here tonight. We landed at 6 o'clock this evening coming out of New York at 10 o'clock this morning with all kinds of complications, but he's here and I couldn't be more thrilled. I'm so proud uh, of Byron for the many things that he has accomplished, but most of all for his love of family and faith and for his appreciation of Catholic schools. And I will let him tell you the rest of his fascinating story. Please welcome Byron Pitts.
I'm leaving Norfolk, I'm going to Orlando. Okay, Grandma, I'm leaving Orlando, I'm going to Atlanta. Okay, baby, I'm leaving Atlanta, I'm going to Boston. And her response was always the same. She would say, what's wrong, baby? <laughs> but as John knows in our business, that's often the, 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 the road you have to travel. As a network uh, journalist for the past 16 years, I've had the good fortune to interview the last six presidents of the United States, and some in office, and some out of office. I've covered three wars. I've been to 53 countries. And at last count, I've watched 49 people die. I've watched as American service members gave their full measure to our great nation in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I witnessed two executions. I was a witness to a man to death in an electric chair in Virginia. And I was a witness to the Timothy McVeigh execution, the, uh, a homegrown terrorist raised in a Christian household, convicted of killing 168 men, women, and children in Oklahoma. I was in New York on 9 11 and watched as many of our citizens, more than 2,000, men and women whose only sin that day was showing up to work. Now, so in many ways, as a journalist, I made my living covering death. And I made my peace with that. But something that still bothers me is indifference. Because I've learned over the years that good and decent people are indifferent about the gifts they've been blessed with to impact their communities, to change someone else's life, that indifference is, is a deadly weapon. So my message tonight is to each of you is to not be indifferent about the opportunities that you have moving forward to contribute to the lives of people in this community. Uh, Deion Sanders, the great American historian, Put it this way. <laughs> 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 played football not too far from here a few years back at Florida State University and had a pretty good career in the NFL and Major League Baseball was great. Dion, when he was inducted into the uh, Football Hall of Fame, said that if your dream only includes you, then your dream isn't big enough. I like that. If your dream only includes you, then your dream is bigger. I know that everyone in this room, that this is, as the bishop told me, this is the cream and the crop of, of Savannah. The business leaders and educators, community activists, people who have put their time and treasure into this community to make Savannah what it is now and to make it even better going forward. And so I want to encourage you to continue doing it because each of you can make a difference in someone's life. I know that not just because of what I do as a professional journalist. I know that because of the life I've lived. You see, long before I was ever a writer in the of ABC News, and before that of 60 Minutes, being by in some nights 18 million people. Long before that, I was a kid from East Baltimore, and nobody knew my name. My mother had her first child at 17. She had me before she finished high school. I didn't learn to read until I was 12. I spoke with a stutter until I was a junior college. In elementary school, in middle school, failing every class, they, going to public school, they brought me to see specialists to see what the problems were. They ran a series of tests. And so finally, when the test results came in, they called my mother in. And my mother, God called her home a few years ago. Her name is Clary Spitz. My mother is a, was a Southern woman, and there's something wonderful, it seems to me, about Southern women. There is a stubbornness. <laughs> so when they called my mother in to give her, and brought me in to give her the test results, at that particular time, my mother had a 10th grade education. Now, my mother, like all of you, always had the value of education. Eventually, she would go back to school and earn a college degree not long after my sister in sociology from Oregon State University in Baltimore. And she spent the bulk of her professional life as a social worker, working with women and families much like her own. But at that particular moment in her life, she had a tempered education. 
She was a seamstress at the London Fog Coke Factory in Baltimore. Uh, I would imagine a lot of folk in this room who own the London Fog, most likely stitched together by a woman much like my mom. So there she is standing in front of these folk with the initials behind their names to give her the results of these tests on her youngest child. And they said, Ms. Fitz, we've run the test and it's our conclusion that your son Byron is mentally retarded. <laughs> and we believe he should be institutionalized. Wow. That was my mother's reaction. Wonderful reaction. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so my mother said, would you test him again? And they said, well, Ms. Fitz, did you hear what we just said? And she said, well, didn't you hear what I just said? Test him again. So they ran the test again, and they brought us back a few weeks later, and the test results were the same. They said, Ms. Fitz, it's our recommendation, because you lack the resources to provide your child the help he needs, it's our suggestion that you place him, uh, that you keep him at home if you choose to, uh, if you don't want to put him in an institution. And perhaps when he's 18, resources will be available to get him help. And my mother says, if I wait until my child is 18 years old, my boy will be dead or in prison. My son needs help right now. But none was available. Fortunately for me, what my mother lacked in formal education at the time, she made up for it with what the old folks said, her knowledge of the word. You see, for all of my life, and for much of her life, my mother wore around her neck a small mustard seed encased in a clear plastic ball. It was her daily reminder, her visual reminder of the scripture in the book of Matthew that says, if you have faith just the size of a mustard seed, you can say to any mountain, mountain move from here to there, and nothing will be impossible. It is with my mother's mountain-moving faith. She got me the help that I needed to someday live my dream. My, my mother was a woman of, of modest means. She never made more than $10,000 in a single year her entire professional life. At the time she was a seamstress, she made probably about $65, $600 a year. One of the things that my mother decided to do through prayer and, 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 and looking for the best option for her child, because she lacked the resources to do, to do much, was to enroll me in Catholic school. I went to St. Catherine's Elementary School in Baltimore. And eventually I went to Archbishop Curley High School. As a parent myself, it, it amazes me that the tuition uh, bishop, when I was at Curley my freshman year, the tuition was about $3,000. I think about $3,000. And to think that my mother invested nearly half her income into my education, the sacrifice that she made. Yeah, I thought about my mom when I was reading today on the website, the mission statement of Notre Dame Academy. You all should check it out. It's in your program tonight. It reads as follows. Notre Dame Academy is a Catholic school that strives to teach the child not only academic subjects for success in the contemporary world, but also the gospel values rooted in Catholic tradition. At Notre Dame Academy, we are committed to the development of the whole child body and soul, heart and mind. That was the kind of commitment that was needed for a child like me in Baltimore. When the experts said, when the, the smart people said, when the people in public education in Baltimore said, there's nothing we can do for this child, cast him aside. There were good nuns, there were good priests, Franciscans at Archbishop Curley, who who believed in me before I didn't believe in myself. I remember when I showed up in Father Gregory's English class in ninth grade. I was still reading at that point at about fourth grade level. I wasn't prepared to be in this class. I didn't have the skills to be in the ninth grade. But he looked beyond me and saw my need. Not only did he teach me English, he also taught me the value of faith. He reinforced those things that my mother was preaching at home. I like to say I had the best of both worlds. I was raised Baptist, educated Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> I was a Baptist boy at Archbishop Pearl. But the priests there treated me like one of their own. Raised by a single parent. I didn't necessarily, I didn't have the love of my father. But I had the love and 
and support and encouragement and discipline of more than a dozen fathers. Franciscan priests who were kind enough to spend time with me. Father Gregory and, and a group of his friends, I sang in the choir. Uh, I'm always embarrassed when I'm going to run a gifted musician like yourself to say that I sang in the choir. But I did. I sang in the choir. I was a tenor. I was, well, they needed some fellas to fill up the last row, so they were never going to sing. And every year at our church, we would have a gospel concert. Well, I lived in West, my church was in West Baltimore, sort of the, let's say, a, a challenging neighborhood in West Baltimore. Curley, the high school, Archbishop Curley, was in East Baltimore. And every year, about a dozen priests, four years I was in high school, including Father Gregory. Every year, every spring, they would get in the van and they would drive from Curley, where they lived, about 12 miles to West Baltimore in the hood to see me, didn't have a solo, just to see me in the choir. I can't tell you how wonderful that was for me. Always mindful that my own father was not active in my life. But there were these 12 fathers who were active in my life. I remember the first year they showed up. I remember one of my, uh, one of the, the elders in my church, this is the African American Baptist Church. One of the elders, because you know, it's, it's unusual. In the Baptist Church, there were 12 white guys to show up. I remember, I remember there was a big, there was a big commotion in church before the service started. And I, I peeked my head, I said, what was wrong? And someone said, I don't know, 12 cops would show up. to the priest from Archbishop Curley showing up and, and, and embrace them as family and we recognize them each year. But while my church recognized them, everyone knew that those men were there to support me. And it meant the world. Uh, so whenever I have the opportunity, because we, I've stayed in contact with some of them over the years, to say, well, thank you. Thank you so much, man. You didn't simply uh, help change my life. You help save my life. So thank you. Thank you. And that's the kind of opportunity that each of you have to help the children at Notre Dame Academy to breathe words of encouragement into their lives. I remember there was a there was a deacon at my church, Coach Mack. And every day, Coach Mack would see me, he would say, hey, what's up, champ? How you doing? There are only two kinds of people in the world. They're champs and they're chumps. And you like a champ, there's someone call you champ. How you doing, champ? I can't tell you how meaningful that was to a 12-year-old boy reading at a, at that point, first grade level. If you can imagine his head on a 12-year-old boy, it was not an impressive sight. No one could look at me as a 12 year and say, you know what, that kid's going to be on 60 Minutes someday. <laughs> but to have that man in my life, to read those words of encouragement, meant the world to me. So to have people like Coach Mack, certainly my mother and the priest at Arch, Bishop Curley High School. I mean, certainly we all know it takes a group effort to raise a child. Certainly it takes good parents. But we know that so often so many of our children don't necessarily have what we would consider good parents. But it requires other people. And I was blessed. I had, a, I had a great mother. Someone asked my mother uh, years ago, how was she able as a single parent, a divorcee, how was she able to send three kids to college? And my mother, my Bible quote, church going mama said, oh, it's simple. I told each child you would go to college or I would beat you to death. <laughs> My mother was just filling out the application for me to go to Archbishop Curley, tuition, $3,000 a year, income, $6,500 a year. The math didn't add up. I would think between my mother's persuasive talents and the goodness of the, the priests and the leadership at Archbishop Curley, they created a space for me. And this is a kid who couldn't afford to go to the school, who wasn't academically qualified to go to the school. But they gave me an opportunity anyway. And that's what each of you do.
do with your support of Notre Dame Academy. You provide opportunities. There's certainly a number of the children there, if not the vast majority of kids there. Those are children who have parents, a parent, who are supportive, and they will be successful no matter what. But I would imagine, sister, that there are some students at your school that the only thing that will separate success or failure in their lives is Notre Dame. The difference between living a good life, an honorable life, being a tax-paying citizen in our great nation, will be the education they receive there. Now, I know in the room there are some business folk who aren't necessarily inclined and sentimental, that they like hearing nice stories, but you are a folk who like to hear numbers. <laughs> so let me give you some numbers for those folks about why your contribution is so important. It's not just a, a sentimental thing. It's not just a, a nice thing that you do. It is vital. In the state of Georgia, I've reached some numbers. To attend Savannah State University, where my sister attended, the tuition now is about $6,800 a year for an in-state student. Georgia Southern, where my oldest daughter went to school, tuition there is $9,320. I believe the tuition at Notre Dame is about $4,600, is that right? About $4,600. Okay. A lot of money, right? Expensive. University of Georgia. Any bulldogs in the room? No. My daughter goes to Florida, goes to Florida State. I just <laughs> $24 expensive. UGA, $22,000. Georgia Southern, $9,000. Savannah State, $6,000. Notre Dame Academy, $4,600. The average annual cost per inmate in the state of Georgia, $24,194. Now again, for the folk who are here who are business leaders in this community who that's how you see the world. And thank God for that, because we need people with that mindset, with that skill set. Those are the numbers. What is a more effective way to spend your hard-earned money? $4,600 to send a child to Notre Dame Academy. $24,000 to send that same child as a man to prison. Someone told me once, it is far easier to raise a strong boy than it is to heal a broken man. It is far easier to raise a strong boy than it is to heal a broken man. And that's the opportunity that each of you have. Again, thank you for the contributions that you made to Notre Dame and to the other schools in the diocese. It is, it is important, it is honorable work. I know for people like, like the bishop and, and the educators in the room, is sometimes if you are in the business, you're like farmers, right? That you plant a crop that you're never certain how it's going to turn out. And you don't necessarily reap the rewards of your efforts right away, right? I mean, we are a long way from East Baltimore, 1974, with a 14-year-old boy with a fifth grade reading level and ninth grade English class. He very easily could have said, okay, you know, I... I Put him someplace. He can't be in my class. But he saw something. He was committed to educating the whole child. As the mission statement in Notre Dame says, educating the whole child. In my travels as a journalist, I'm clear that that's what's required in this day and age for all of our children. Black, white, rich or poor, male or female. That all of our children need to be dealt with as the whole person. Certainly a wonderful education. But we all know, I think, in this room, the importance of faith, the power of prayer. You know, the book that I wrote that, that the bishop mentioned, it's called Step Out of Nothing. The title comes from a sermon in my home church uh, in New Jersey, where I live now. It was about three or four years ago. It was a Women's Day service. So the majority of the sisters were there, their hats part of the Baptist by the Baptist church. Anybody looking good? Smelling good? One more Sunday. And so the visiting minister was a woman. And so during her message, she was talking about pedicures and manicures and women's sore feet. I thought, my Lord, what time is it? Because <laughs> there was nothing in this sermon at all for me. But then she 
said something that took my breath away. She said in those difficult moments in life, when one's Rolodex or resume, who you know, how much money you have in the bank, what your 401k looks like, isn't enough to get you past a difficult moment. For people of faith, they step out to a place where only God. Now, non-believers would say you are stepping out of nothing. But in fact, we know that we're stepping out of that place where only God is. You've heard my story. I would imagine everyone in this room has a story you can tell about the people, the individuals, the teachers who breathe kindness and goodness into your life to allow you to be where you are now. I would imagine everyone in this room has a favorite scripture, has a story of faith that got you past a difficult moment. You, we have the opportunity to tell our stories, to share those scriptures with the next generation. And I would encourage you to do that. I've laid out the numbers for you, why it is fiscally smart to invest in these children now. Because either we invest in them now, or we will invest in them later. I leave you with a final story as to why I think the work that each of you are engaged in with your commitment to Notre Dame and commitment to this community is so valuable. My message tonight is just to please keep doing what you're doing because you are making a difference in someone's life. I met a, a young man here, Ryan. Are you here? Where are you, Ryan? Tall, good-looking fellow. Is he in the room? Oh, Ryan, right, okay, good. He's 16 years old. He should be home right now. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan graduated. Tall fellow. 6'2". Tall, good-looking fellow. Dressed sharp tonight. We were talking. He goes to one of the public schools uh, here in town. He said he wished he could have attended one of the Catholic high schools in town, but for economic reasons, that wasn't possible. But he was so grateful for his time at Notre Dame Academy. He joked with me, and as, as a teenager, my sister, you know, they really had to hound me. That's, that's the word he used, they had to hound me every day at Notre Dame about my man. I said, I was in detention or study hall every day at Notre Dame. He says, but you know what? He says, now as a freshman in high school, I'm doing 10th grade math because they prepared me that well. And for, and for those of us who have children, to hear a teenager grateful for discipline and structure <laughs> says a lot about what's going on in Notre Dame Academy. So thank each of you for your contributions. But part of my message to you tonight is, is to keep doing what you're doing. But now enlist a friend. I know there's some gentlemen here who are members of country clubs. I, 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 I see the tan lines on your hand. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got one too. That's right. I, 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 I encourage you to go back to, and, and talk to some of your fellow club members about Notre Dame Academy. And, and certainly tell them the nice stories about the good people you met and how they're helping children out. But give them those numbers. Men and women who I'm sure are mindful of the economics of life. Tell them their numbers. Tell them that they're looking for places to contribute. Notre Dame Academy is a place they should and can contribute. I would imagine in this room there, there's some folk here who are near retirement. You have time. I would encourage you maybe to spend some of that time at Notre Dame Academy as a volunteer. One of, my, one of my personal issues outside of my professional life is literacy because of my own story with literacy. A couple of things about literacy. Again, golfers, when you're talking to your friends about why it's important that they be involved in their community, they be involved in Notre Dame Academy. It's estimated that most children, all children, learn to read from birth to seven. Children learn to read, all children, learn to read from birth to age seven. And from seven on, children read to learn. In my own case, they believe, because I clearly I wasn't retarded. I mean, I had issues, but that, but that wasn't <laughs> that wasn't the time. I was raised by a single parent. As, as my mother would, would, would jokingly say years later, she, she, her life was busy. She had three jobs, three children, and an unfaithful husband. Her day was full. So the idea of, that was a joke, you all could laugh. She didn't have the time to read to me as a child. She was preoccupied with feeding me and keeping me and my siblings out of trouble. 
It's estimated that the children of the middle class by age seven have heard about five million more words than the children of the poor. That the children of wealthy parents have heard about 10 million more words by age seven than the children of the poor. Children learn to read birth and seven, read to learn thereafter. So if you have treasure to share with Notre Dame Academy, please do. But if, if the gift you have is time, what a powerful gift it would be to come to the school and to just read to the children. Again, I don't mean to pick on the golfers, but I will. Maybe on some Tuesdays, instead of playing 18, play 9. And then spend an hour at the school. I can't tell you what a powerful gift and symbol it will be to the children at the school, especially the boys, to see a man reading a lot. For the men of color in this room, to see a man of color reading aloud and, and, and to let them see that education matters will make a difference. In my hometown of Baltimore, a community not that different from Savannah, certainly not that different from Buffalo, where the is from. A few years ago, I was talking at a charter school, and this isn't a charter school story. We all know the value of charter school. Now, I, I tend to favor Catholic school education, but that's just my own personal bias. At this particular charter school in uh, East Baltimore, 68% of the students come from no parent household. 68% of the students at that school come from no parent households. I've never heard the term before. But these are children who go home, they don't live with a mother or father. They live with perhaps a grandparent, an aunt, an uncle, a cousin, foster kid. I would imagine there may be a few children at Notre Dame Academy who would fall in that same category. Now, I know many of us know the challenges of being raised by a single parent. I cannot imagine the hardship of going home every day and not being greeted by mom or dad. At this particular charter school in Baltimore, 68% of the kids come from no parent household. I would imagine the numbers aren't that off in Savannah. So, after talking to the students one day about the importance of education, the value of faith, and having dreams, and re remaining optimistic about your life, I want to believe that, that might be a faith-based value, whether one is Catholic or Baptist or Muslim. But you know, in many ways, it is an American value. We are the most terrible people on Earth. An earthquake strikes Haiti. America leaves their relief back. A tsunami devastates Indonesia. America leads the effort. Even in a foul-mouthed, nasty, rude place like New York City. <laughs> After 9-11, people came together. I remember being down in Lower Manhattan for hours and days and weeks after 9-11. A small thing, but I never heard anyone use profanity. After 9-30 on September 11th. Now I would imagine in Savannah, that's no big achievement. <laughs> but in a place like New York, trust me. <laughs> but it speaks to how we as Americans, we always rise to the occasion. I tell people all the time, yes, that we are a nation that is flawed. Yes, we all know many of our flaws. But my travels around the world tell me that we are the greatest country on earth. The promise of America is like no place else on earth, only in America. It doesn't matter where you're born. The poorest farm, the poorest gap. My mother used to say, her, my mother's philosophy for raising her children is that if you work hard and pray hard and treat people right, good things will happen because good people will come into your life. The bishop is an example of that. He didn't know me from that. I was a number on a sheet of paper in his classroom. He could have very easily have cast me aside, but he didn't. That's the greatness of our country. Sometimes I think we have to be an American citizen in this great nation. A few years ago, I was in Washington, D.C. on business. And I get, out, get off the train, I'm running, it's rainy, it's cold, I'm in a bad mood, and I hop in the cab. The cab driver says, good morning, brother! <laughs> I'm like, man. <laughs> So I said, good morning. Kind of, kind of like the way you all greeted me when I first said it. I said, good morning, sometimes I talk that, 
I get there. So I sat there quietly, hoping this man would drive fast and not talk. He says, so brother, how are you this morning? I said, I'm fine, thank you. Well, thank you for asking me. I'll tell you how I'm doing. <laughs> I quickly assessed the situation and, and came to the conclusion that this man must be a Nebri. There's no way to explain his enthusiasm that time of day. So I think, okay, Lord, if it's your will, I make it to this location on time with the wrong cab driver. I guess I'll make it on time. So the guy says, brother, let me tell you this story about why this is such a great day for me. He says, brother, he says, today, this day, my wife gave birth to our first child. And that child is now an American citizen. He says, I'm from Ethiopia. My wife is from Ethiopia. And this year, my wife and I were in our master's degree in business this year. He said, oh, brother, America is such a magical place. He says, brother, says my sister, I have a twin sister. We were raised in Ethiopia. At the time of our childhood, it was illegal to own have possession of American currency. But our father, their mother died when they were young, raised by a single parent, their father. They're a good single father in this world. He said, our father every now and then would, would call us into his bedroom if he thought that we needed some encouragement. He would go into this closet, into a fake bottom of the closet, take out a box, a wooden box, and inside that box was one U.S. dollar. And so every so often when we need encouragement, our father would say, look, look, Look at this. Look at what it says. In America, it says, in God we trust. That in America, anything is possible. Anyone can live their dream. My friends, so often we take that for granted as American citizens. How blessed we are. Despite our many problems, we remain the enemy of the world. People around the world send their so wonderful opportunity we are presented with tonight and going forward to help the children at Notre Dame Academy. To be the one. That when a child at that school wonders at night, where do I go? Where do I hide when the world hurts too much? That you can be the one who can say, come to me. Thank you.